Welcome to the second episode of the Fitted Furniture Makers podcast. On this podcast, we talk to different woodworkers with an emphasis on fitted furniture, and we try to get under the skin of how they make their work, but also what motivates them and the values that lie behind what they do. So in this episode, we're talking to Finbar Lucas. Hi, Finbar. Hi, Alistair. How are you? Good, thanks. Good to have you with us. So go right ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, to start the start, I was born in Cork in southwest Ireland. Grew up on a little island called Cape Clear, uh, which is only three miles by one off southwest Cork until I was about three and a half. When, um, for various reasons, my parents essentially ran out of money and my dad needed to carry on working in London. So we moved to London. I grew up in Harrow in the end in northwest London until I was uh, ready to study. So, yeah, that's my that's my start and then I came to Sheffield to study fine art which is how I ended up in this part of the world which is where we how we know each other mm. uh yeah and I think you know in terms of creativity my my interest in fine art came from an interest in drawing and uh when I was a kid I played with Lego all the time as well so that kind of that interest in 2D and 3D has always been there it was always it was always the way I spent my time if I got the chance so um i think so, from from knowing from, from having met you and seeing seeing some of your work up close and following you on instagram it's clear that you have a, a design minded approach to your work and and mm -hmm. i see you very much as a craftsman as well someone that that is mm. keen to make beautiful pieces um so the i can see that the the aesthetics i suppose are important to you yeah i think i probably come at furniture making primarily from a from an artist's um angle rather than from a not necessarily not from a maker's angle but but not from a not from a, a skill not from although i've developed the skills to make the work i want to make i've, I've always come at it i think more from a, from form you know more from from um the 3d form as opposed to the to the furniture form that's interesting and so how did you how did you end up doing the woodworking? Was it something you anticipated doing or, or not at all? I don't remember, I don't remember having a plan, which was part of the reason for doing a fine art degree um, back in the heady days of the nineties when you didn't have to pay for your own course. Uh, you, could, you could make uh, incautious decisions such as taking a three year fine art course purely because it would give you three years to mess about and try and put off actually deciding what to do with your life um, which I think is no bad thing at that age but uh, I don't think you get the opportunity these days do you? Um, no and I think a lot of people don't really know what they want to do with their lives and still commit to, yeah. to a course including a lot of debt that's, that's and then go in a different direction that's absolutely right I think it's much too early really in your late teens to start kind of shelling out tens of thousands based on some mm. idea of what you might want to do and I didn't I didn't have to do that I chose a fine art course which you know suited lots of aspects of what I was doing uh, how I wanted to you know how I wanted to spend my time and um, and then what happened I think was was that I was frustrated with the course itself which to some degree which which was down to it being quite theoretical and I spent um, a little while after my course quite frustrated and, and unsure about the direction that I wanted to go in. But I realised I was actually, I was messing around in the house where I was renting, trying to make shelving for the bathroom there. And I was getting very excited by the 3D possibilities of, uh, of literally of shelves, you know, which some people will laugh at when I tell them that it was kind of just, um, it was like a, an interest in 3D uh, 3D on the wall, which is like a sculptural interest, if you like. It's very interesting hearing you talk about that. I'm, I'm going to just um, screen share your Instagram feed for those who are watching this on video to see. And the way you talk about 3D form approaching shelves, I'm sure there are plenty of woodworkers out there that don't that don't start the process with this idea of form, and you're talking sort of artistically, sculpturally. Yeah. Um, for many, shells may just be functional or just something to to pay the bills. But I think that approach comes out very clearly in the work that you do. That you delight mm. in the shape of things, and I think you can see it in your photographer's eye as well in how you 
you clearly like the look and the grain of wood and the shapes that you can create with it. Uh, what you're saying, you were suggesting that you were getting frustrated with the theoretical approach and really wanted to be hands on and producing the forms. I had a very similar experience moving from architecture into woodwork working. So I studied architecture, but became very, I felt very unfulfilled so long as I was just designing and mm. not getting to, to, to be hands on making the shapes that I was drawing. I just felt like I could never be as happy until I actually got making what, whatever the thing was. So um, I think I've, I've always admired as well the work that you do. And I see, I see a lot of integrity and values in it in terms of it being mostly solid wood and very carefully made and um, both beautiful and, and strong joints being used in what you do. Mm -hmm. um, so to help us get a little bit under the skin of how you make things, can you tell us firstly how you would typically make a shaker door and then how you would make a floating shelf in an alcove? Okay. Well, I will make shaker doors. I, I try as much as possible to work in hardwoods. And um, so if I'm making a shaker door, 99% of the time it's, it's in um, oak or ash, and I will uh, buy rough sawn timber, um, do an initial plane up, let it rest because it tends to move a little bit after that planing process. So I'll leave it a couple of mil too thick and too wide. I'll do a second plane to size, um, and then the kind of business of making the frames them, themselves, the door, the door frames. It, I bet you find this. It's changed over the years, but I've ended up with the um, system using a domino and making and using oh, the okay. 10 mil domino cutter um, and uh, the full extent of that. So you've got the 50 mil long dominoes. And I will, I mean, this all over the years, I've tried all various different types and they all work more or less well, but this is the way we do it now. So I'll put, um, depending on the size of the door frame, I'll put one or two dominoes in each, uh, the top and bottom of each style. Mm -hmm. That's the next um, stage. And then I will um, route grooves, in the um, full, uh, up, up the full extent of the style and on the inside of the, of the rails. Just to interrupt, presumably it's the full length of the rails and stopped on the styles, right? The, the groove. No, no. And oh. that's just an interest. I suppose that's maybe coming from having made them traditionally for so long using haunched to mortise and 10 joint is I, 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 I prefer to get a little bit of the material of the rail into the style. So I make a stub tenon. Oh, you, that's interesting. So I, I make a, a groove, you know, in that traditional way, mm. I put a groove all the way up the inside of the style top, style top to bottom. I also like the aesthetic of having the little uh, tenon, you know, the stub tenon emerging at the top of the door. Um, and, then, and then I'll put a stub tenon on. So what, what happens is you'll put a 56 mil, um, the, the, the full extent of your domino, mortise is 56 mil but by okay. the time you drop six mil into into the into the style from the rail you've ended up with a 50 mil uh, mortise and use a 50 mil or they're actually 48 aren't they 48 mil domino so that's how i'll make that and that's there. that's the bigger domino joint or is it the df no no it's just one. a regular one yeah i would like is a it? larger one yeah i mean and and for, you know for a okay. uh, kitchen door that's fine 25 mil of Domino is a decent amount. Yeah, and that was which thickness of domino? Sorry, those are the ten mils. Right. Yeah. So that's as big as the small the small jointer goes, isn't it? So these doors are, these doors are typically how thick? Uh, they'd finish at twenty, I suppose. Twenty mil. Oh, okay. Okay. I'm mm. I'm interested that it's a mixture of traditional and modern because when mm. you said you use the domino. I, to me, that seemed like a departure from your roots because I see you doing a lot of handcrafted traditional joints. Yeah. But so it is interesting that you've not let go of the traditional jointing methods, but the domino is like a reinforcement. So you're still you're still taking the yeah. time. Yeah. I'm very. I'm possibly. I mean, I think all woodworkers are cautious by nature. Is that? I think is that a fair statement to make? We generally you you you, you get enough. You get enough. Um, you get enough reminders uh, to be cautious in your in your making time. Uh, I, yes. I find if you, if you're not cautious enough, you will 
you will perpetually bump into uh, reasons why you should have taken a bit more care or thought it through a little harder until you just get you get beaten by the material into I felt like I was shown over several years of mm. my you know the start of my career to um, to to take your time and do belt and braces and think through all the possible things that the wood the, the wood might be subjected to. So and I suppose if you're not cautious by nature, then you're going to get so frustrated with that process that you're probably not going to stick with this as a career. Yeah, and that's interesting you say that, actually, because I think, did I just say I was cautious by nature? I think I've become cautious by nature in woodwork, well, it, but I don't know if I'm cautious by nature by Oh, character. really? Okay. I think, I I think, think you said I think you yeah. said most woodworkers are cautious. Is, is right, yeah, it, yeah. And that got me, I was just thinking through that as you were talking then, because I do think that woodworkers who end up in this field of making doors and fitting furniture, scribing, that sort of thing. I do think it takes a, a certain type of person with a high level of attention to detail and pride in their work. And I think caution may often be part of that, that personality type. Um, because yeah, you, you, can't, you can't, you need to think, you need to plan and think things through and think through the consequences, because as you've suggested, it will come back to bite you if you don't, if that door then warps or falls apart or whatever. So your preferred method to make a shaker door is hardwoods. Now I've discussed with you before that I've often had trouble working with hardwoods and um, somewhat against my original intentions in going into woodwork, I now do work majority in MDF. And I know that's the case for a lot of fitted furniture uh, makers that I follow on Instagram. And that's for me, that's partly, I did a few jobs that were white painted and then got asked to do a lot more. It just became what, mm. we, what we do. But every time I've dabbled with making hardwood doors from scratch, I, I've, my, I think partly my patience hasn't coped with it. Um, and we were talking about the character of a woodworker being cautious. I think a woodworker needs to be patient. I've, I've personally found that my, my patience has decreased since I've had to balance the making with the business side of it. And that's always been a tension for me. I don't entirely do the work I'd, I'd most like to be doing because I never quite managed to make that sort of work work from a business point of view for me. So, so that's one reason why I very much admire people like yourself who are really making a good go over hardwood crafted approach um the have you ever had issues with doors bending because this has been one of my issues with with hardwoods and i've struggled to fully get around it with temperature conditions in the workshop etc i've always been concerned mm -hmm. that any hardwood doors mm -hmm. i make would would warp so what what are your tips for avoiding that happening Well, it's, uh, it's that's a big question, isn't it? There are so many factors at work. Um, I have had issues of movement. Um, doors will twist from time to time, but they will do in board materials, won't they? I mean, um, they will do in certainly sheep, sheep, sheep birch ply. I've, I've made kitchen doors um, from, you know, just cutting out rectangles of birch ply, and I found mm -hmm. those. Have twisted as well okay. but in terms of hardwoods it's going to be a combination of making sure the timber is really dry when you get started on it and working in a workshop where the um, moisture content is pretty similar to most people's houses has been a real advantage and i've got um, a workshop with underfloor heating so it's around about the oh. same as your average house i didn't realize that um, that's, that's a real bonus and that's that's a luxury yeah. that, that um i think is relatively rare in smaller workshops. You, you have a fairly yeah, recent yeah, workshop, cold. don't you, in Manor, Manor yeah. Tumpet in Sheffield? That's it. it, that's it. We moved in in 2011 and it was freshly finished at that point. So it is um, the best workshop I'll ever have, there's no doubt about it. Um, I've gone from the usual uh, setup where you have a colder damp workshop um, and in winter you might be making work in, a, in a, a workshop at eight or nine or 10 degrees, depending, you know, maybe 12 and then you're taking it and putting it in a centrally heated house that might get kept at 19 or 20 degrees yes. and you have all the issues that that can bring 
Uh, and now I've gone slightly, I can sometimes go actually the other way. It's a great problem to have, but I can be taking work out of a warm workshop in winter and taking it to a house where they keep the kitchen a little bit colder and damper than my workshop. Yeah. And the problem is that it's, it's actually expanding slightly or changing shape slightly because of there's, there's more uh, moisture in the, uh, in their kitchen than there is in my workshop, which is a rare problem to have to deal with. Moisture content is a large part of why, why hardwood furniture will change shape, I think, as well as, you know, it depends on where you get your timber from. It depends on how well it was dried before it came to you. It depends on the grain direction and, mm -hmm. you know, knots and those kind of problems that most people, you know, most of the timber we use won't have knots in it, but occasionally and do you end up with quite wacky and interesting. Okay. Do you, do you personally... Do you personally select each board or do you have a supplier yeah. you trust to just send them over? I will, if I absolutely can, I will select everything. Absolutely. I won't, I, I don't like buying timber blind as it were, where they've just picked the three boards. You ask for three boards, they give you three boards. That's the three boards you're having. That seems very, I'm really not, I'm not comfortable doing that. No. So, Moving on to the next question, how would you make a floating shelf in an alcove? What would be your preferred method? Um, okay, now this was shown to me that before I really even got going in business, the chap that, that helped, helped me get started was the, the father of a friend of mine, and he showed me this technique, which I've used ever since really, with a bit of variation, which is to say making, so I'm often, again, it's hard, it's often um, making hardwood um, alcove shelving. Uh, sometimes quite often with a wany edge on the front. Um, mm. I will make the shelf oversize, um, not particularly over width, but over length slightly, uh, and just give it an initial belt of sand. And then I'm, you know, I'm usually making six or eight, something like that, rather than one. Mm -hmm. I'll take those on site with a load of 20 mil by 20 mil pine battens with, um, they're not 20 actually, they probably end up being more like, 12 by 15 or some that kind of that kind of size so 12 mil thick mm -hmm. and um with holes can sunk holes in them and i'll put those on the wall at the right points and those are going to be buried in the inside of the of the, of the shell okay um so I'll, I'll put the i'll put the battens on um either side of the alcove and then each uh depending on the how regular the alcove is if it's a if it's a relatively newly plastered alcove and it's not got a great deal of variation there won't be that much work to get each of those pieces of hardwood to lengthen at the right angle on the end uh or sometimes you can have quite interesting alcoves can't you it's you can really can't well you aware. yes what, what would be your bumps in the hollow yes what would be your method to shape them do you would you make a template in thin board and then transfer that shape to the to each shelf or how would you go about it if I put a line of pairs of uh, buttons all the way up an alcove because I'm filling in the shells, I will try and find the, the smallest gap, you know, the, the, within millimetres, it's all millimetres on the whole, isn't it? But if there's, yes. if there's something that's two or three millimetres less than everything else, uh, I'll try and make the, sh the first shelf to fit in that shortest space, the smallest shelf, therefore, uh, by basically a process of measuring uh, squares and if it's really desperate if it's a very uh, organic alcove i'll end up making a template um okay. cut that shelf to length uh cut all those ends so that the shelf's in nicely sitting essentially just on top of that uh, pair of battens that can eventually be slid over i'll drop it on and then i will use that shelf as a template all the way up and down uh in the i space. understand yeah so i've it's the smallest or fit right. everywhere else. Yes. So I'll then pop it on the next pair of buttons up, say, and, and go, you can oh, just, this one's the same, but the next one. Yeah. Couple and you, you can eye off, can't you? You can, you can, sometimes I'll do something like that and I'll mark on the edge, like plus three millimeters at this point or whatever. Or sometimes you can just eye exactly. it on and think, well, I just, I know without having to mark yeah. it, just move it to the next piece and just add a bit on as I draw. You have a look and you go, that's two mil to nothing. There's like a dart I yeah. to stick on the next one and then you just cut that one out and you draw around it, cut the next one out and move on up really. But templates are necessary, especially for complicated shape, you know, for alcoves that are particularly lively or sometimes they're very, they're heavy. Sometimes I'm putting in 
you know, 35 or 40 mil thick hardwood shelves that are 1.1 meters long and you're doing it at seven or eight foot up. And I just don't want to be hefting a shelf up and down endlessly as a template. So I'll make it out of three mil board, you know. That's the choice you have to make as a woodworker, isn't it? You, you can have a method and then sometimes you're applying the method that's always worked, but in this situation, it's actually not better or faster. Mm. And mm. I've, I've often been guilty of this. I've thought, I don't want to make a template because I'm cutting something, then I'm cutting it again. So I've mm. stuck rigidly to, I just want to cut the piece and improve my methods to cut the piece. But sometimes you do have to let go of a process to embrace another process that is actually quicker for that, for that situation. I you think, have to. Yeah. I think it's a, yeah. a sort of it's a flexibility of thought, isn't it? An ability to step back from the problem mm. in hand and assess the, yeah. the way of, of tackling the problem. Well, I mean, what we're talking about with alcove shelves, I'm, you know, the final process, once all those shelves are fitted and they're all at 120 grit, just belt sanded hardwood, and I'll get them back to the workshop. I'll route the slots in the side ready to go in over the over the battens. And I'll also finish the shelf at that point. That's the way I I've been doing this kind of two-stage fitting. Because I was always on site earlier in my career with finished shelves. I was then mm -hmm. hefting around and cutting to, and potentially marking or damaging that finish. So I'll work with them at a fairly early stage and then I'll cut them and sand them and glaze them, uh, route them rather, and then I'll bring them back and just give so them then the you've last got, job. You've got no issues of, of cutting through the pre-finished edge yeah okay. exactly all sorts of possibilities of marking them when you when you're trying to deal with them on site but you know in reflecting on what you were saying there, i get these alcoves where they flare wide as you go back and yes. um and i've had I'm to do you, things like I, sorry glad you glad you raised that because that the method you've talked about i don't use that method largely for that reason because i had a lot yeah. of alcoves when i tried that method where you couldn't push it in because mm. it flared out so yes mm. tell us how you deal with that well if it's if, if 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 that's the situation it's often it's not not that much but it can be 10 or 15 millimeters that you're dealing with isn't it and it, it's not going to be acceptable to just to just leave the shelf at 90 degrees and explain to the customer that their alcoves with the wrong shelf shape for your design so so i've done things like i've made those shelves fit into that shape so they're not then we're now going to slide it because they're too wide at the back to go into the alcove. And then I've, instead of routing a groove, I routed a rebate and made little covers for the back. So you're now going to put that shelf in at an angle, drop to those yes. battens, and then glue underneath, uh, made from the same material. Uh, covers for those pine buttons, and now that's that's the, that's the job where you just come away from it thinking, well, at least we didn't lose too much. <laughs> money on it because those are the kind of jobs where you, you didn't if you were not careful and you didn't inspect the alcove closely enough at the start you find yourself having to do all that extra work yes. to give them what, what what you quoted for but you know it's an extra five or six hours of messing about that you yes. don't really plan for in the first place so, um, and how, how do you find many the... chances go, go. to lose money on, on oh there are so many ways to lose money aren't there <laughs> count the ways to lose money doing <laughs> doing woodwork <laughs> How is the money for you on, for example, these types of jobs we're talking about? Perhaps, perhaps just stick on alcove shelves. Um, what sort of amount do you charge for a shelf done in the, in the way that you've just described? And are you happy with the profitability of a typical job? Uh, it, it, it averages out, I imagine, being these wany edged hardwood shelves. It probably averages out at something in the region of £100 per shelf. Hmm. It's profitable when, because of the very, I suppose, you know, unlike yourself, Alistair, if you focus down on your, um, the, the work you make, it, I get the impression is often within quite a small, you're, you're trying to keep yourself into quite a small bracket of the work that you make, you know, with white yes. painted fitted furniture. Yes, um, with often. a view to, to standardising the process to get faster yeah. and more profitable at the same price point. I've not been as clever as you. So what I've done is the opposite, where I've kind of ended up. If I'm not kept, but not to some degree, I feel like I've, what I've done is I've made myself very good at an awful lot of different things, or pretty good at a lot of different things. Uh, but 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 never making enough of one thing at times to kind of refine all my processes and start to make it really pay. So I 
I, uh, the good thing about Alco shells is I have made enough of them now that I've got, there's a set of processes just in the back of my mind that I can go through. So the profitability from Alco shells in some degree comes from the fact that I can slightly do it. You know, I can do that slightly um, whilst thinking about other things. I, you know, the, the, ga the gain is not having to invest too much of my brain in it. In uh, yes, it is nice to have some jobs <laughs> where you can just get on with it um, yeah. and, and, and predict fairly well the outcome and the process to get there. Mm. Something that comes across very clearly from the work I've seen and from talking to you is uh, real attention to detail and a desire for high quality outcome. And I'm sure your customers mm. appreciate that. Would you say that your customer base in recent years has um, in, increased and improved in, in quality and willingness to pay more? To a large degree, although I would say 2019 wasn't good in that respect, but on the whole, I think I've moved my business towards, I think I didn't start it particularly knowing where it was heading, but it has ended up heading towards um, it's like I've kind of steered it like an oil tanker slowly but surely over the years towards people who are interested in uh, commissioning the kind of work that I want to make. Slightly older, slightly more interesting alternative artistically minded clients in Sheffield who are looking for interesting work from locally sourced timber. That's my ideal customer really. Okay, so, so what is your ideal project? um <clears throat> well it, it, you know it's interesting it's 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 almost more that it's an ideal customer i do i, I want to be making i want to be using the locally sourced hardwoods if possible would that i i mean the absolute ideal would be with that i've bought green and dried myself uh, so i know where that wood came from and when i've dried it myself i've brought it into the workshop and finished it off I've, uh, and then and then someone has come to me asking for a one-off handmade uh, cabinet or table or table and chairs. Uh, and they've worked, these people, ideally I work very closely with those uh, customers and get to know them a little bit mm -hmm. uh, and get a sense of their aesthetic and what they're interested in, in from this work, what, what it means to them. The meaning is important. Okay. And then um, using traditional methods, but also those sculptural and you know it's curves that I've become uh, slightly known for and it's curved curved the challenges of making curved work and also using traditional techniques in combination is um, that's a real that's a really lovely thing to try and do you, you had or, an, a number of these doors that have a very organic mm -hmm. um, sort of like a an opening mouth door um, I'm trying to describe yeah. it for those that are just listening on the audio, but it's a slab door with a mm -hmm. very sculptural sort of edge that curves out to grab it, mm -hmm. which looks like it's probably a lot of work to make. A fantastic amount of work. <laughs> um, and also made from laminated birch plywood. Uh, so mm. those doors had to be made from 24 millimeter birch ply um, stacked up on metal tubing uh, is vast each of those doors was different many many hours of sure. labor if anyone looks at them they'll probably be able to see um yeah. quite how much messing about it was the effect was great yeah and that's yeah. an interesting I mean, that is fitted uh so it doesn't fit with what i was saying about my you know most ideal projects but um so your most ideal project wouldn't necessarily be a fitted furniture piece it'd be a freestanding crafted beautiful yeah. item would it freestanding and, and and there's there's reasons for that partly uh, as i get a bit older i don't particularly like turning up on site with a load of tools um but but, but also um i think for my own reasons reasons of of uh the longevity of a piece because a freestanding, a well-made freestanding piece, I think has much more chance of lasting than a well-made, even the best made fitted furniture, because people, even if the work's really, really, if you, if you buy a house, even if it's got wonderful quality work in it, if it doesn't fit with your aesthetic, then chances are eventually you're gonna rip it out. 
And, and it's um, important to you to create something that is going to last, that's coming across. Most definitely, you know, and I think, you know, it fits with the interest I have in sustainability is part of the sustainability is if a work lasts a long time, then it is more sustainable. I mean, almost literally, but also, you know, you could you can make one table every 20 years or one table every 100 years and you've, 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 um, you've used a lot less material. And if you end up with a table that lasted 100 years, then I think to some degree that makes it more sustainable, almost regardless of what it's made from, because it's because you've not used so much uh, resource every time you make a new table. Good point. So thinking about your motivation now and your, your values, a lot of this is coming across already. Sustainability is clearly very important to you. I'm very interested in sustainability in all aspects of my life really, but certainly I want my work to reflect that. So I want to make work as well as possible, designed as well as possible from the best materials in such a way that people will almost never really conscience getting rid of it. It will always have a life somewhere. You know, you might have commissioned this chest of drawers 50 years ago and pass it on to your child and they eventually don't have room for it and they sell it, but it's not, it's not ever going in a, you know, it's not ever going on a skip. It's going to end up somewhere because it's just too well made and too nice. Um, so there's that aspect of it and using the locally sourced timber, uh, fits with that in my mind is the, the carbon footprint of locally sourced timber is obviously much smaller. Um, there's all sorts of benefits to, to maintaining and managing local woodlands um, and, and, and making them pay for themselves partly by felling the mature trees and using them for things like woodwork, uh, furniture making. So all of that fits within my uh, interest. Okay. A couple of other questions on my, my list are what do you love about your work and what do you hate about your work? Now I'm picking up a lot of love for your work. Are there any aspects of it that, that really grind and you don't enjoy? Because it's being self-employed and a lot of self-employed people, whether you've got a business or you're just a freelance will find this, the, the motivation sometimes, um, Overall motivation isn't an issue. I enjoy the work I do, but sometimes there's, when you haven't got a boss, uh, and I haven't had a boss for many years, when, when a boss isn't telling you what to do and you need to find it within yourself each day to, to, to kind of uh, generate your own uh, schedule, uh, prioritise, uh, get the work done that you're not necessarily feeling like before you get on with the work that you need to do, that you enjoy, all of that, all of that self uh, um, direction sometimes not most of the time is fine and it's what I chose to do but occasionally you just not you really would love someone to turn up at your workshop at eight o'clock in the morning and give you a list and you know, it would be great I totally <laughs> relate to that it's a sort of decision fatigue isn't it I think as yeah. woodworkers we're we're creative we love to make and to to do it our way um, but structure sometimes would be helpful and I, I do often yearn for uh, mm. someone else to create the structure and then I don't have to think about mm. it, just come in and do, mm. do what I want to do. But um, I suppose there will always be tensions in, in any setup. Now, as, as, you look forward, as you look forward to the growth of your business, what would be the ideal size and shape of your business in terms of staffing? I, I, I think I might know the answer to this already, um, and perhaps you're already there, but what would be the ideal look of your business? Um, mm. Say five, ten years down the line, how would you like it to look? At the moment, what I'm doing, I've, I've largely worked to commission for almost the whole of my career, 18, 19 years. Um, I've largely made work to commission. Uh, and what I'm trying to do in the, in the last year or so, I've been, I've been trying to just broaden the uh, areas I work in so that I am still... I probably will always make a lot of work to commission, but I'm trying to develop um, uh, other other aspects of my work. I'm trying to make um, some off-the-shelf pieces, design a range of furniture, which is then um, possibly going to go into shops or be sold online. Um, okay. So, so, so that's more, tables, more mass-produced, uh, systemized approach. So presumably, yeah. still, I mean, it's still the hardwoods and the handcrafting, but still, that's it. Yeah. yeah batch production so um i'll have worked out the designs and worked out the price and it makes it a little bit more predictable uh because you know we haven't touched on this at all but obviously when you're making work to commission you can get things wrong 
depending 10, 20, 30, 40% on timings, can't you? And, um, yes. and you just have to eat, eat that up, you know, and I, it, it, sometimes you just get a bit, if you, if you get more than one or two wrong on the trot, you can end up um, in a little bit of a hole. Uh, yeah. So nice to have that more predictable, um, uh, the time scales and the material needed to make work. Uh, I also want to develop teaching um, courses because I've been teaching for Sheffield University last year. I noticed that there's an image here on your Instagram. That's at the yeah. university, isn't it? So what students are you teaching there? What subject is this? This is actually a dropping course for anyone at Sheffield University. But the, the students that largely came along were engineering and architecture students or computer, uh, computer design students. Um, and they hadn't got any real hand tools experience. So I was just introducing them to hand tools on the whole and giving them small projects to attempt um, in their workshop at um, uh, in Sheffield University there. So it was a really exciting experience actually um, to try and develop courses for, for young people with very little uh, previous experience. Um, and it's made me want to develop a course of my own for my own, to, to, to teach for my own workshop. I think having having studied architecture myself at Sheffield University, I'm really glad to see people like you going in and teaching hands-on skills. I remember, mm. um, I think it was after my degree, I did a bit of traveling and I met uh, a German uh, architecture student while traveling. And he said that in Germany, you can't fully qualify as an architect unless you've done, I think it was at least a year in a trade which struck me as very sensible because there's a real disconnect very often between architects or engineers or designers and makers. And I think designers often idealize a way of making something which maybe looks really good in, in a 3D drawing program and has been very satisfying to design, but may very well be unnecessarily complex or inefficient or in, mm. actually in, inelegant to somebody who understands perhaps the grain of, of wood or, or the mm. structure better. And I don't think you can fully understand that without working with it. No, that's very true. Wood is a particular material and you need to get your hands on it, don't you? You need to spend some time just trying to work it before you start to uh, appreciate uh, the best way to use it or, or, the, or the limitations of it. Yeah. Um, it's a fascinating thing. It's a fascinating thing to introduce to, to people. And I'm looking forward to working. Um, working up a couple of courses really making small items uh, but two or three people in the workshop so it should be a nice um, quite a nice kind of intimate environment for people I hope they feel supported because like you say it's quite a challenge uh, as you get started on something like woodwork in such a big field yes um, yeah well is there anything else before we wrap this up that you'd like to to talk about well, there's only one more thing, I suppose, Alistair, if you've got two minutes, which is yeah. this uh, project I've been developing with uh, a couple of people, one, one of whom, Rob Cole, of she uh, Sheffield Sustainable Kitchens, and a, yes. another woman called Ethel Altervake, which we sh we've chatted about, which is called the Sheffield Sustainability Network. Um, and we've been working uh, towards the end of last year, developing um, what this might become. It's essentially going to be a way of connecting up Sheffield businesses uh, large and small to help each other um, become more sustainable uh, because of the um, climate crisis that we can't any longer ignore you know the, the, the news comes thick and fast um, and we're trying to just find a way of connecting um, people in Sheffield so they can all support each other um, identify um, I suppose initially just easy wins you know things that people don't necessarily realize they can do to reduce their carbon footprint or their waste uh, and, uh, and and eventually, hopefully, create something quite useful and powerful in Sheffield itself. Because I think I don't know if you feel like this, but I certainly feel like businesses are slightly passed by. Um, we're all frowned upon if we're driving a diesel van mm. or, 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 or or having to rent a skip on a site. Uh, but no one's there telling you what you can do differently or, or, or necessarily helping you kind of work out the way forward. Yes, I I certainly hear what you're saying. I think when you're trying to run a business and you need to make it financially viable, if it's your only source of income, you're often faced with impossible demands that you can't reconcile as much as you'd like. And that's, that remains a big tension for me. Um, I suppose it does for all of us. And I, I think you, you, you end up having to fall down on, on one, fall on one particular side of the argument, either um, be at peace with 
what you're making and doing because it fits your values, mm. but maybe then struggle financially or with work life work life balance, or you get the business on on a much sounder business footing, but feel like you're slightly um, not living your values. And uh, I I feel I'm I'm a little more than I'd like to be towards that that side of things. And so I do I do particularly enjoy talking to people like yourself who I feel have have kept the integrity of your values and the type of things that you want to make very central. So I'd certainly be interested in connecting with this network and seeing how I might be able to move my business in a, a more sustainable direction. Yeah, certainly. Um, and I'm, I'm quite hopeful for that. And it's an exciting project to, to come in at the very start of really to, to help form and shape, you know, so. Yeah, sounds good. Well, I, I will put that under the, under the video here and in the description um on youtube and on the podcast so well we wish you well with that and and i hope to i hope to follow that and perhaps be helped by that in my business yeah thank you okay thank you finbar it's been really interesting and um i look forward to seeing whatever you get up to next on instagram and uh keep in touch thanks so much Alice. i've really enjoyed it me too okay have a good day cheers to all. cheers bye